Hello, I'm Mercedes Stevenson, and this is the West Block Politics, Perspectives, and Players. You're going to attack the great dam of Western Germany. Stand by, everyone. We're going in. It's got to be done at low level. That scene from the 1955 film classic Dam Busters portrays the secret mission to destroy Germany's hydroelectric dams nearly 76 years ago. This legendary mission, codenamed Operation Chastise, is credited as having helped change the course of World War II. The bombing of these dams inside the Third Reich destroyed massive water reservoirs used for power to build Germany's military. What role did Canada play in all of this? Joining me now is Ted Barris, author of Dam Busters, Canadian Airmen, and the Secret Raid Against Germany. Ted, I'm very interested to know what led you to this story because it's the first time I've really heard about Canadians being involved. Well, I saw the movie, and it, as you said, it was a classic, and to sort of take all this in as a, I was taking in it as a 10-year-old back in the 60s, and I was just mesmerized by this whole notion of the bouncing bomb going in to destroy the dams. And it wasn't until many years later when I met Fred Sutherland, uh, who just passed away two weeks ago in Rocky Mountain House, the last Canadian surviving member of the Dam Busters team, that I realized Canadians were involved. So I began to track down all the other 29 Canadians through, and of course they're all gone now, but through their logbooks, through their families' uh, correspondence, through illegal diaries some of these guys kept, and illegal photography, I was able to put the whole story back together again with the Canadians in the right roles and right places. So I was intrigued as a kid, and then as a, this is my 18th book. So finally, I, my publisher allowed me to get around to this in, in the 75th anniversary year. And take us through what exactly the Canadians' roles were in this critical operation. It, every role the Canadians played. Um, we saw uh, Richard Todd playing Wing Commander Guy Gibson in the film clip, and he's announcing to the crews that they're about to go and raid the dams with this bouncing bomb. Not until that day, when he announces that they're going into the dams, does any of the crews know that they're going there. They've been training for seven weeks, flying low level. Behind you are the Parliament buildings. If you can imagine a 12-ton Lancaster bomber, four engines traveling all the way from England to Germany and back, just about the level of the rooftops of the center block, all that distance and back to fly under the radar, the Canadians were in every crew position among the 19 Lancasters that pulled this off. They were pilots and navigators and wireless radio operators and gunners and bomb aimers and even ground crew, there were Canadians, in this raid all kept secret. Why was this particular mission so critical? And I'm, I'm wondering if it was also maybe a bit controversial. Uh, well, it was secret, so nobody knew until it happened. In fact, um, many of the townspeople right outside the town where these guys flew from, Scampton in England, had no idea this was going on, the training and so on. Controversial in the sense that a lot of men didn't come back. Of the 19 Lancasters that flew with that low-level mission to bring this bouncing bomb to the dams, uh, only 11 came back. So 56 men were lost in one night's operation. That was a, a controversy. But, and, it, and it really didn't deliver the death knell to the Reich in destroying those reservoirs and the dams. It slowed down production naturally, but they rebuilt the dams the Nazis did in 79 days. But what was the turning point in terms of uh, the war was that at least at the end of that operation, the Nazis knew that the Allies were going to attack them wherever they could, where they were most vulnerable. They were vulnerable at the dams. And what it did is it gave um, particularly the Brits, as well as the Canadians and the Australians and New Zealanders, other Commonwealth nations, some hope. Within days of the operation, the King and Queen, King George and Queen Elizabeth, actually visit Scampton where these young men, and the picture on the front page of the book shows these guys, the, the survivors, they're about to meet the King and Queen. And it wasn't a kind of a rigid, kind of um, uh, not terribly uh, conversational gathering. The King and Queen were there to thank these guys for giving the Commonwealth and through them the Allies hope. There had been no hope in 1943 until this operation. So the Dam Busters raid really turns the tide in terms of the spirit of the Allied operations. And so they gave the flicker of hope that maybe this war could be turned and, and won. Well, hugely critical operation based on that. Yeah. And, and that hope being so important, especially when democracies fight because the will of the people is so important and uh, such tremendous stress during this war. How is it that there's Canadians that were so involved in this and we really haven't heard about their legacy? Well, we're not flag wavers in this country. We don't, you know, stand up the way Brits do and Americans do and say, here's what we did in the Second World War. In fact, 
some people think that the Americans won the war or that the Brits did. Well, excuse me, but the Canadians were there in all the major operations. So we're more subtle, more reserved in this. Finding these 30 stories for the men who actually participated in this was a bit of a struggle because most of the families, too, are modest. But when we began to gather, when we launched this book back last, late last summer and through the fall, the families came together. There were 50, 60 of them that had traveled all the way to Alberta, to Nanton, this little museum south of Calgary. And there were 16 Dambuster families for the first time brought together representation uh, from those families to say, what a great moment in history this was. What an extraordinary moment for Canada, for Canadian airmen. And suddenly, these children and grandchildren and sisters and brothers and some widows who were there were proud. They finally got a chance to say, we were part of that. Our sons, our uncles, uh, our brothers were part of this operation and they were allowed to be proud. We don't have any of these veterans, as you were saying, anymore, the Canadians alive. They've all passed on. But when you had a chance to meet or speak with them, to read diaries, to read stories, how did they describe this mission and what it was like to be flying so low over enemy territory, such incredible danger, and not even knowing what you're doing until the day you're actually taking off? Well, we mentioned Fred. Fred Sutherland was a front gunner in one of the Lancasters. He had nothing to do with the planning of the navigation and the dropping of the bomb. He had to defend the aircraft. But the other thing he had to do, and this is what he talks about in my interviews with him and in some of his diaries that he had sort of recorded at the time, he had to watch out for all the low-strung hydro wires between when they hit the coast in Holland, which was occupied, all the way to the Ruhr and back. So that he's literally alerting the pilot should they, and they're, cause they're flying at night, moonlit and clear, but you couldn't always see the wires, and the big high-tension wires all the way across Europe were perhaps the greatest enemy to the low-flying Lancasters. So he'd have to shout out, and this is what, why Fred sweat about it so long through the, the operation. He didn't have to do much firing on the way in or back, but to keep, he was the eyes of the Lancaster going in and coming out to keep his eye out for the pilot for the low-strung wires. And that scared him more than almost anything else. Like it, trying to see those wires yeah. at night and under yeah. that kind of tension and then stress. And know that, you know, it, one slight mistake in the, in the pilot's moves and they could be into the trees. They were flying so low going in on the coast of Holland into what, is the, what was then the Zoiter Z. They were literally dodging the islands on the way in and hopping over treetops on the way in so that they could escape the German radar and sneak into Germany and back. Uh, unfortunately, by the time they got there and delivered the bombs, the Germans were alerted, and so they were ready for them when they were, many of them were going back, and that's why uh, eight of the Lancasters went down. What was the German reaction when you look at the historical records? To oh, this they raid? were mortified. Absolutely. The Nazis were absolutely uh, mortified that the, that the RAF and the RCAF and all the other Commonwealth Air, Air Forces would have the audacity to sneak in at night and bomb their dams because they weren't that well defended. They had torpedo nets strung on the reservoirs because they thought the only weapon that could attack the uh, dams were torpedoes. So they had these big nets strung in the water. Well, the bouncing bomb invented by Barnes Wallace, this eccentric British engineer, which literally bounced like a skipping stone over top of the water of the reservoir and came to rest at the back of the dam and then sank and exploded went right over top of the nets and otherwise they were very poorly defended and so these uh, horrific explosions that occurred at the dams blew them wide open and set the Germans back in terms of their industrial production. So um, it was a very much pr propaganda oriented recovery because there were 1400 people who died in the flooding that followed um, the raid through the Ruhr Valley. The, the, the water was pouring through the dams for 48 hours killed 1,400 people, many of them innocent. But the Nazis figured the way to strike back at the, at the Allies is to cover all, you know, 1,400 of the coffins with swastikas, even if, they had, even if they were prisoners of war or forced laborers from Belgium and Russia and so on. They were all covered in swastikas. So they made the most of the moment. So in a way, it was, it was a propaganda lift for them, turning the corner in that point of the war, but more for the Allies, because here they had literally taken the war to deep into Germany for the first time. Two days after the raid, Winston Churchill's in Washington addressing Congress. And he can now say, we have taken the war right to the heart of Nazi Germany, which he couldn't say before. And it was the men in this operation who had delivered that. What kind of reaction has your book been getting so far? I'm pleased to say most of the veterans' families are so thrilled that their relative stories are out there. It's got a constituency, yes, among veterans. It's got a constituency among, you know, uh, aviation buffs and, and uh, military historians. But what's gratifying is when, when young people who know nothing about this operation and not a whole lot about the Second World War say, 
I had no idea the Canadians did this. And so there's that pride that the families felt, to a certain extent shared by audiences that I've been speaking to. I've probably spoken to a hundred different audiences in the, since the book came out. And it's great to, to hear some of the veterans' families say, you didn't get all of the stories of my uncle or my dad in there, but you got the story of what they did in there, and that's most important.